My mind is all I have. It is my dreams, my thoughts, my very soul. And I am about to have it desecrated, mutilated, and parts of it cut out. And I have never been happier at this prospect than any other in my life. I yearn to be altered so. I stand in an interminably long queue of my fellow humans. With each step I get closer to the moment, the blessed time when I can have my mind wiped. The thoughts, sensations, memories of sights, smells and sounds of these last days removed. I want to push everyone out of the way and charge headlong to the front of the queue. I want to shout, to scream that I should be next to be free of these dark memories and apparitions that haunt my every second. I cannot even bear to close my eyes as the memories, the images, are scorched onto the back of my eyelids like a dark tableau of atrocities against the Emperor, against sanity, against every law the mortal realms obey. But I see the same desperation in the eyes of all around me, all those ahead of me, all those behind me. We are all of one mind, one goal, one purpose. To have the knowledge burned from us, so we can rest again. So we can go back to thinking and believing in a world of good. A world of safety. A world that is free from the horrors we have witnessed. To return to the bliss of ignorance. I will give anything to be cleansed again. To be clean. To be free. To be pure. Given the choice. I would even choose to become a servitor, a mindless lobotomized drone. As long as these memories are gone, they must be gone. I cannot live with the weight anymore, for I have seen the things that stare at us from behind the veil. I have witnessed their lust for our destruction, our pain, our suffering. I have witnessed their power, and I am terrified. It has only been three days. Just three days since it all began. Cannot believe it myself. How fast it all happened. How utterly pathetic and naive I was. We all were. How our perception of reality was shattered in just under a day. Emperor, why won't this line move faster? Why? It began on a normal day, a normal morning, on a normal world. Cannot tell why it began. There are rumours but few are really willing to discuss what we saw, or why. Some say that the lords of our rather unobtrusive and unimportant world grew complacent. The imperial tithes were being paid, and there was a higher level of prosperity than anywhere I have heard of in this sector. Perhaps that was the cause. Laziness. Laziness and boredom. I hate to think of that being it, but can come no closer to a better explanation. That our world was destroyed... We were subjected to the event, due to someone being bored. Bored because their life was too easy, or bored because they simply wished drama, but did not wish the actual danger, or the hard work of signing up to the life of the guard. All I can hope is that they were on the receiving end of this calamity as much as their hapless population of serfs. Somehow I doubt it though, but I can hope. It is all that is keeping me from pushing forward. The thought that those responsible for this were somehow at the centre of the whirlwind when it hit. Small comfort. It happened so fast. As usual, I was on my way for my first shift, and the air was cool and bright. The first light of dawn slowly illuminating everything. The world was waking. It was then that it started. I have often been told to look where I am going. Look forward instead of up, as my father always used to say. But I was looking up. Perhaps the only one who was. I always ask the same question of myself every day. Why are some born to be noble? To live in glittering skyscrapers of light? While others, like me, are born to drudge until we die? As I saw the light of the sun kiss each skyscraper in turn, I saw it begin. The light hit the Tower of Faris, and it was loosed. A scream seemed to come from every point above me at the same time. A scream of a million voices all in one. A scream of elation, a scream of joy. 
a scream of victory. With this, the light of the sun became unbearable, reflected from the shining spires of the Tower of the House of Faris. Like a myriad prisms all at once, the light went from bright white to every single possible spectrum on hue. It was dazzling, entrancing, but too much. The kaleidoscope of light reached across the skies and all was bathed in its unnatural touch. The colours were too much, too bright, too sublime, too true. Never before had I seen colours this dynamic, this bright. But my mind was in shock. The experience too much. I began to weep and then to howl. It was like pain and pleasure in equal measure, and all of it beyond my thresholds. The light obfuscated what happened next, but of that I am very glad. The eye too overstimulated to work correctly. The things I saw, the things I think I saw, is why I am so ardently in this line now. Pandemonium was loosed on my world, and everything I held dear and everything I thought I knew were shattered in that moment. The heavens broke, and holes in reality opened. When I even think of those swirling pools of light that appeared, my mind goes into shock. I wish to look away, but it is my memory I flee, so I cannot. Things came out of the portals. Things of such diversity of size, shade, shape and formation that I cannot even begin to describe. If I were given a hundred years, I could not describe them all. But I would never wish to do this. Never wish to face the memory so starkly. The things they did. Each one dragged, pirouetted or slunk from the portals in space. These doors into hell. Then they wasted no time. Like long caged animals that had finally seen a way to escape, they fell on all with a rapacious appetite, an utter verve that staggered me. It was their joy in it all. What they did to those they leapt upon. Unspeakable things. Unnatural things. Impossible things. I was so assailed by a cacophony of pain and pleasure, grunts of pure ecstasy, and screams of terror and pain and anguish from every quarter. But some things were similar, and some of them worked at seeming odds to the rest. One particular form of these horrors, like a gorgeous female human, but with unnatural appendages and claws and hooves where other elements should be. They were the most regular of all the travesties I witnessed. Like acrobats, they bounded around the thoroughfare I was in. They did not stop to indulge in their vile needs. They just gathered, collected. I was one of those taken by one of those lithe but preternaturally strong beings. She scooped me up and ran with me across the ground, sometimes launching herself and I into the air to hurdle a vicious and salacious scene that could not be otherwise passed. I saw a myriad of other beings like she, it, catching people and they all moved in one direction. We were being brought to the amphitheater of House Faris. Hundreds of us. Thousands of us. As we approached the great building, which would normally permit comfortable seating for well over 500,000 citizens, again, she, it, took to the air. It landed on the walls, her spindly but extended nails like knives cutting into the side of the edifice and allowing her purchase. She launched herself up the wall with me in tow. It held on to me by my foot, swinging me into the air whenever it wished to move faster and bound upward, only to catch my leg again on the downward fall. The jarring of my bones and muscles was little compared to the jarring of my world and mind. Each time this occurred, I let out a wail of pain, but only after a loud bellow of joy. The feeling of being launched so, into the sliding lights, the screams and grunts of pleasure and pain, cannot explain it. Despite being in mortal fear of my life, my world, my very soul, when I was hurled upward my body and brain reacted in elation, even as my spirit screamed. We cleared the top of the amphitheatre only for her to toss me one more time. This time she caught me with a gentleness, almost loving care, as if she held me like a child in her arms and then cooed at me. Looking into her full black eyes, her hand caressing my face and wiping the hair out of my eyes, it felt maternal and gentle. She smiled an alluring smile that brightened her entire face. In that moment, I felt that I loved her. 
but the thought now makes my gorge rise. My stomach rebels at the very thought. So alien. So corrupt. Yet in that moment I felt under her protection and thankful for it. But it was not to last. His face went back to a mask of terror and rage as she dropped me into a chair and placed her hand on my head, her claws entirely circling my skull. She then twisted my head and forced me to look down into the centre of the theatre. My eyes locked onto the spectacle that was occurring so far below me, yet so clear despite the salt of colours and images. I was wrapped. I did not even notice when her clawed hand was removed from my head and I was simply left there like a puppet. I could not move. I could not look away. I could not escape. I was not even able to blink. My mind screamed. My body wished to close tight the eyelids that would prevent me from witnessing what was occurring below, but I could not. Days passed. I felt my eyeballs dry and the pain of the constant crying made me feel like I would dehydrate before it was over. So intense was the experience. But I watched for days. The acts of debauchery, degradation that I was forced to endure. At points I was titillated to the excruciating levels, only wishing to be involved in the smallest, most simple way, wishing so hard to be at the centre of the debacle that was going on. But at others I was repulsed as I had never been repulsed before. Inside I was screaming. It was simply not possible to endure this scene and retain sanity. It was too much. Too unspeakable. Too... just too much. The thousands, or even hundreds of thousands, who used up in these twisted events I could not even count. But that is when it changed. When my mind was not only wishing for this to continue instead of stop, but more than this. When my mind was cheering and wishing for ever more extreme activities to occur. When I was actively wishing for this to never end and for it only become darker and darker. That is when it changed. Somehow I believed that the acts I saw were all leading to this point. It was as if the hatred, pain, pleasure and lust that was unfolding before me somehow was feeding something. For the performance came to a crescendo. After this point a great thing arrived. A being. A rent in space like the other side witnessed before, but of a scale much greater, tore itself into existence. From the centre of this rent in space, with colours and sounds even more intense than those I had already been subjected to, something seemed to force its way into existence. Like a birth. There was a bending of the light. Like the real world was somehow trying to push back and prevent this thing from coming through. But reality was not the winner in this struggle. As the light bulged and eventually a sucking pop rang around the amphitheatre, followed immediately by a cacophony of screams, something took form. It started as a gas, a ghost at first, but the gas, the energy, filled in a shape, a form. A form that became colossal in size and then solidity, brilliant with light and power. The entire smell in the amphitheatre also altered, from acrid to stifling too pleasurable, too intense. Like the huge thing gave off some airborne narcotic, but there was nothing natural about any of this, I was sure. It had arrived. Somehow I knew that it was their master, them being the things that had captured and raped our world and every living thing on it. It was their lord. The scream resounded across every chair, every glistening eye and statue-like watcher. But as the scream ended its first rotation, for there would be many more crashing across us like waves, everything changed again. There was a burst of light, five to be precise, but they were not blinding and not multiple hues. It was white light. It was pure. And they were there, all standing at cardinal points around this great thing of evil. The figures were clad in silver armour that reflected only white light, pure light, not the myriad hues and colours that surrounded them on all sides. The being at the centre, that which had been summoned into this reality, reacted with a baleful bellow of fury. Thus was battle joined. Not that I could describe it or explain it. 
The five warriors were dressed in the armor of space marines, Astartes, but they did not seem like they do in the vids. They wielded weapons that glowed and crackled as if alive, each one shining like a lighthouse in a storm. It was like watching heroic knights with solid suns in their hands, forged into the shapes of swords and glaives. Bolts of power rippled from one side onto the other and slammed into egg-like invisible shells around the marines. They were like tales of the Emperor. They were like his spirit had been cut into pieces and placed it within armor to fight his very battles. The light that came from them pushed against the colors broadcast by the evil entity. I could not look away. I barely saw out of the periphery of my vision that other lights had dotted around the theater and were moving amongst us watchers, the unwilling crowd of witnesses, the congregation in this vile church. I was barely aware of them moving like the wind, cutting swathes of these female crab women apart as they leapt forward toward them. I felt the splatter of blood strike my back as a fray occurred behind me. Pieces of female things were thrown into the air and landed around me as the warriors of light butchered. This was happening all around the amphitheater, but I could not look away from the center of the play before me. The being made foray after foray against the shining knights. It would bound at one to turn on another, always moving and always attempting to escape the five-pointed fence that the marines made around it. As it moved, they moved. As it attacked, they blocked or withdrew. Never before have I been so enwrapped, so diligently watching anything, yet seen so little. The speed of their moves was like unto a dance, but the central dancer could not escape their support. Finally, all of the shining warriors began to intone a chant. A chant I felt glad to hear, yet did not know it. I have never before heard it. Hope to never hear it again. The chanting rose in power as the warriors struck at the beast in their midst, never tiring, never slipping, never taking their attention away from their prize for a nanosecond. It seemed as if the very presence of the knights dealt hurt to the monster. As it closed on any of them, its very skin and hair would erupt into flame, only to recover when it leapt backwards or sideways, when it was further from the Shining Knights. But eventually they closed so that it could not escape, and could not avoid being near any of them. Then it burned like someone had doused it in Prometheum. Its cries of rage and suffering rent at my heart. The huge burning thing was unable to escape, and the chant rose to a pitch whereas it seemed to come from everywhere, bounced around the amphitheater in a round with the scream that had birthed the beast. Then one of the knights strode forward and engaged it alone. Their movements were too fast for me to see, for me to follow, but all ended in silence when the figures both seemed to suddenly stop. The knight stood stock still. The beast stopped, and then its head toppled forward away from its body. As its skull struck the ground, everything ended. The single touch of its severed head to the dirt, and all was blown away like it had never happened. The light returned to normal, the skies became blue, the walls white, the sands a dull yellow, where they were not drenched with the brown of dried blood and excretions. It was almost dull. And as one, we, the martinets held in thrall, were freed. I saw so many slowly slide their eyes one way then the other. Few moved at first, as if to move would break the spell and the horror would begin again. But, like a dam bursting, the wailing soon began. A shrill wailing that came from the very heart, the guts of everyone there. Lamentation and disbelief rose like a tsunami. For an instant, I wished that the Warriors of Light had not arrived. Then we could have continued to believe that this was all a dream. It had not actually happened. But the stark reality was that it had happened. Despite all of the things, female and other, simply disappearing without trace. And we all knew that it could happen again. This revelation broke many there and then. Those that did not weep began to jabber and scream profanities. For these, the work of the Silvered Warriors was continued, as they moved amongst the crowd, executing those who had blatantly been broken by it all. It was done swiftly. It was done cleanly. The next day was a blur. Everyone in the amphitheater was herded into transports and holding areas. The skies were ablaze and abuzz with the crossing of more and more transports. Where they all had come from, nobody could tell, but their intent was simple. All who had survived this event would be gathered. We did not know why, then, 
but it was soon revealed to us that for the protection of our souls, we could be cleansed. We could be purified by the warriors of light. They would burn the memory from us, but they would also purge the evil left dormant in us by merely witnessing it. We could be clean again. So, I stand in line and desperately keep my eyes open, locked on the person in front of me. I do not wish to close my eyes. I do not wish to see those things again. Emperor's mercy, why will this lie not move faster? I started drawing this circle a decade ago, carving it thick, carving it deep. My master found me, discovered my plan, and then stopped me. We almost dueled over it, but he was the mightier, so I backed down. A curled lip in the dark was all the rebellion I gave as he pontificated. We never employ the methods of the enemy. We do not meet with them, we do not entreat with them. For ruin and doom are all that come of such foolishness. One does not make pacts with the dark gods, for the price is always higher than that which you are willing to pay. But he was a scared old fool. Despite his power, his craft, his wisdom, he died of the pox last fall. Since then it has been never ending. One pestilence, one plague after another. The crops blighted, the herds thin, the village slowly dying. No respite, no mercy. So I have travelled a full day away from the village, as I did a decade ago, and begun my ritual. I have studied the winds of magic under my master, and then alone, for almost two decades, I am able to do this. I know how to contain and constrain. I carve the sigils and circles in the earth, deep, to prevent erasure. Those inside the circle will augment my cry into the winds, will call that which I require, call so loud, so powerful, that not even it will be able to resist. The runes and glyphs outside of the circles, to enhance their efficacy, to make them unbreakable, for it cannot be allowed out. It cannot. I perform the rites. I sacrifice. And then I wait. But I do not wait long. The ground gently shakes, and the branches of the trees above me seem to meet and make a dark canopy to prevent moonlight from striking the circles. In the dark and all alone, I feel more than see the being dragging itself out of the muck. Huge, as I had expected, as I had prepared for it in my circles and wards. It pushes upwards and almost touches the limbs of the trees before bursting into dazzling light for an instant, green of course, then comes down to a lambent glow, still green, but of a more murky hue. I can feel its presence as it tests the lines of my defences, the compulsions put on it by my mystic scripts. Its small head, atop a mound of green leather-encased blubber, now looks down at me. Its grinning face, now put into stark detail by its eyes, the light bursting from them, denoting its power. Inside I quail, but this is the human inside of the wizard. I stand proudly in front of it. My wards protect me. It chortles a deep gravelly belly laugh, then speaks for the first time. Be swift, wizard, for your frame cannot channel enough of the winds of chaos, of magic, to keep me here for long, little mortal. State your case. I suck in a deep breath and then blurt out the words I had thought to deliver so casually, with conviction. Representative of the Great Grandfather, our village labours under your blessings, but without thy mercy. Our people die, our crops sour, our livestock expire. You have blessed us mightily. Now we have seen the light. 
we are prepared to bend the knee. Ho, 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 ho. And what wilt thou give unto the grandfather for his clemency? We would be his people. We would be under his aegis. We offer to give praise to him every day on the seventh hour and every night on the seventh hour. We will praise the grandfather in aught else that we do. We will devote our lives to him if he would but spare us and give us all of his blessings, not just its rough edges. And you speak for all in your village. I speak for myself first, then those who would see the wisdom of our cause, the effect of the grandfather's full blessings. I would take his power into the village and show his bounty, his magnificence. Then it shall be as you say. I will anoint thee in his name. The demon slowly reached towards the wizard, who took no step back. Half of him was awaiting the touch of this putrescent being. The other half laughed internally that the demon prince did not recognize how trapped and constrained it was inside the mystic circles and wards as it was. But his eyes widened as the hand passed his last wards without event, and the index finger of the great unclean one gently caressed his brow. Instantly he was struck with a widening pattern of rashes from the point of contact, crashing along at every inch of his skin. It was not possible. As the pain then rushed down him, he screamed, but did not fall to his knees. As the feeling swiftly passed, replaced by a calm and almost joyous temperament that he knew had no genesis within his own soul. The demon chortled once more, and then his body began to fall apart as the last of the wizard's power was drawn from him. As the mammoth being just fell apart, the wizard could make out the back of the circle, that which he could not see before due to the bulk of the great unclean one. There were many multiple breaches across every inch of the circle, every ward, as maggots and flies had swarmed across the lines, having broken them already. It was a good thing that the wizard had come as a supplicant, for if he had not, then he would already be dead. The man then reached for his staff and made to begin the long trek back to his village to bring the blessings of the grandfather to his people. He would touch them all as he was touched, anointed by the greater demon. They would be infected they would be ugly. They would be worshippers of a dark and terrible god. But they would be alive. We track their armies back to their lair. Not very difficult, it would seem. We are Astartes of the sons of Corvus Corax. So it was to be expected. Our armor all in black and muffled, we advanced through the undergrowth towards the center of the ruckus, for there seemed to be some form of celebration in the offering. As we prowled forward, all took in the spectacle before us, like some twisted mockery of our own practices. The forces of chaos were having what can only be described as a victory ceremony. Ha! We had given more than we had gotten, so the spray of martial endeavor seemed so full of itself. We had butchered thousands of the scum, yet here they were celebrating their meager spoils. We moved up and watched as a huge mass of leather and blubber, a mountain of green pus and intestines held court. It would wait a supplicant coming forward, showing off a bolt gun here, guard dog tags there. Each time the mass, the great unclean one, would nod its approval always after a beaming look of surprise and perhaps even a mild nudge or wink toward the being, demon or mortal, that had brought forward its token of victory, its spoils. Strangest was when a moving carpet of tiny green copies of the great unclean one, nurglings, I think they are called, processed to its feet, holding multiple marine helmets on their upheld hands. The guffaw that came from the demon was positively girlish, so happy was it that multiple of these tiny replicas of it were drawn into the arms of the great unclean one and almost daintily kissed and returned to the mass. It was repugnant. 
Our comrades' armor being used as totems like this. So we prepared to strike. Our first salvo saw multiple missiles streaking through the undergrowth of the Hulk. Our bolters slammed into it as they hit. Huge explosions crackled across its carcass, blowing sizable chunks out of it, covering the congregation and the forest around it. A wailing went up almost immediately, as the mass Nurgle worshippers in Neverborn lamented the loss of the avatar of their god. Or so I thought. But as the smoke cleared, the pus and blood and skin landed around us like rain. We all beheld a measure of our attack. Nothing. The huge blob merely laughed and laughed, and all the wild little nurglings, little things, leapt into it and onto it, repairing the wounds our weapons had torn from it. Nor were the masses lamenting as I had thought. The dirge quickly rose in pitch and intensity as all around us, all before us, now some behind, let rip a scream from their lungs. As the great unclean one laughed, it rose its hands to the heavens in some form of calling. With that the decaying trees around us, the ones we hung from to gain the best fire aperture, they all burst into life. Branches twisted and grabbed at my brethren, lifting them into the skies and twisting them until they all that could be heard were a crescendo of sharp cracks and dull implosions. Those of us who struggled free of the now animated trees, hacking with our combat knives, were not spared. The carpets of these little things came around us from behind, pulling men down and wrestling their helmets from them, crunching on their faces and their skulls thereafter. Amongst the throngs were larger beasts, drones and one-eyed monsters. All fell on us. As I was held down by a mass of these horrible little nurglings, the last thing I experienced was the leering face of a one-eyed monster as its more opened and perfect gothic swept out of it. Welcome to our banquet, mortal. You shall be our guest of honour. It looks down on me, its face so similar to ours, yet not. The light that shines and illuminates, he and I, and the board I am on. The utensils on the myriad racks behind us, around us. They glisten. All are of different sizes, metals, shapes, designs. Some are delicate, exquisite, one might say. Others look cruel and heavy and terrible. But all are sharp and all unglisten with reflected light. Racks run for as far as I can see, well into the darkness and beyond. Like a huge warehouse of equipment where no two things are contained that are the same. And we are at its center. Above us is darkness, but I can feel things, swaying, perhaps hanging just outside the light, perhaps hundreds of meters above. It is impossible to tell. But I can hear the creak of chains, the slight grinding of metal on metal, rusts bitten down on each other. I can almost feel anticipation emanating from the darkness, like a wave of excitement. Or is it hunger? We have an audience. But if that is so, then I am the main attraction. It would be a first. All of my existence I have been nothing. From my time of first breath to the moment it all I had thought at the time ended. Nothing. I was a menial in a huge, choked jungle of plasteel concrete and doors. Always doors. Metal walls, metal floors, metal skies, metal dreams, metal existence. Metal and stone. One of the pointless, thankless, teeming billions of a hive. Each day is a toil. Each night is tiredness, not even begun to be scratched by the limited hours we are permitted to rest. It seeps into you until you are always tired. Never time for what someone might call recreation. What is that in the hive? If you do not work, you are sent to the queues. Nobody says it, but we all know. For all who join the queues stand, occasionally slouch a few paces, then stand again. 
but when they reach the gates to the processing plant, there is no seeing them again. Yet trailers full of corpse starch come out the other end. I saw them once when I was young, when I managed to get through one of the doors, hiding from sight behind the crowds who went through one way or the other, but only once. And none believed me. Not because they did not believe, I think, but because they did not wish to know. None did. So in time, I stopped talking about it to anyone. As later I came to find out that all knew. We just did not talk about it. To think that the conclusion of our days of endless toil, endless suffering were for nothing. That there was no reward at its end, but to shuffle one last time towards a place that would make us into the meal of the morrow. Better to never think about it. But that was then, when we were free citizens of the Imperium of Mankind. Yesterday, before the assault, before the Night of Terrors, the night I was taken by the evil ones, Xenos. The ones who came to take us. The ones who herded us through the habs, through the runs and tunnels. Who slew any who resisted. Slew many who did not. And merely cackled like demented jesters. They were like stretched people. Like a mirror room of magic. Where the fat become thin and the short become tall. These things. They could look beautiful and terrible all in the same moment. When they moved it was a blur, a dream made real. They just appeared and darted around us so fast none could truly see them move. And it was over. Like a nightmare, it happened so fast. It happened so thoroughly. I saw the endless ships they brought down, the lines of us that were being herded towards shimmering holes in the space, like doorways into the realms of dreams. Always doorways. And I was pushed through one eventually. Resistance was futile and final. And after all, what could I be scared of? Because when it came down to it, I was nothing. I am nothing. And could there really be anything worse than that which we already faced every day? The death of dreams. The death of hope. The slow deterioration of our bodies as we were ground down by long hours, little food and no reason, no reason at all, to continue. Nothing to aspire to, nowhere to escape. So when these stretched men and women, these aliens who looked so much like us when at rest, went still, when they pushed me through the tear in reality into the light, I did not go with trepidation. But expectation. Because what could be worse than being nothing? I could not have known. And here I am, strapped to a board, immobile. Like a maestro of some orchestra, the thing above me elegantly bows to the darkness above, around us, the silent shadow. He indicates with a flourish of his hands so many that he is about to begin. For all the world, if I had not been at the centre stage, I would have been enwrapped and as excited at the promised spectacle as any who may be watching now. He was so elegant, despite his terrible visage. So terrible. I felt like I was in the presence of a dark performer who played to the gods themselves. If he were not one, at this thought, his head snapped up, its eyes full on mine, those terrible eyes. He moved toward me, but there was no sound of steps, no movement or swaying in him. It was as if he simply glided toward me. I could not move my head to look down over the edge of the elaborate slab I was on to confirm whether he levitated or if some other force kept him from the ground, for nothing that walks moves so cleanly so smoothly. Nothing. But as he closed, his mouth opened, and out came a language I understood. How? The Xenos are animals, 
as what I knew, what I had been told. Yet this one moved like a ghost, like an apparition, and spoke as we. No, no, worm. You were right before you were right. You do indeed lay in the presence of a dark performer, and as you felt so rightly, you lay in the presence of a god. Me. I shall perform a transaction possible only to the divine. For I now tear back the veil. I shall slip my hand into the very mouth of eternity, of finality, of death. And I shall drag out the beings I've deigned to save from its maw, from its hunger. And the only coin I require, the only fuel for my alchemy, my miracle, is the most base and useless material the universe knows of, the dregs of reality that nobody wishes existed, and never will any mourn. Its eyes encompass me entirely. I drown in its sparkling pools as it nods its head to me and smiles a terrible rictus grin and says, You. We will go on a journey together. You will walk in the footsteps of titans. We'll be shown all of the wonders that I have accrued over my near endless existence. All this I will do for you. To you. So they may live. So they may breathe again. He looks up at this, and to the darkness above us. For they have paid the ferryman, as your people would say. And I shall bring them back across the rivers of night to my side, and then back out into the great city, the Sempiternal City, the dark city of Cormora. But our journey, it shall be long. It shall be glorious. You will experience more in these days and weeks than even the accumulated memory of your entire race can fathom. It will be without compare. For I am, as you so rightly identified, so quickly grasped, a god amongst mortals. I am so far beyond anything you can presently imagine that it is truly a gift to share this with you. I am not sure you are worthy, but we shall discern this on the trek together, forever together. You will live out the last of your existence in my presence, so blessed art thou. While I work, while I perform my opus on your body, in your body, on your mind, in your soul, I will enlighten you. I will raise you up. I shall sing you a lullaby without end, for your life shall conclude for ere it will. For I shall sing thee the tale of what some call the fool, which we call, well, inevitability, evolution, apotheosis. I will make your senses sing, your every nerve and your own flare with the most incandescent of experiences. I will allow you to flee and catch you again, time and time again. I will send dark things to fill your mind while I take your eyes out still functioning, then place them at a vantage point so you can see me unbind and rebind your body again and again. Sometimes I will allow you to experience each slice, each caress, each movement as it occurs. At other times I will deny you the reality of the experience while you witness it, then have it all crash down onto you in a nanosecond as I reattach your eyes, like the pain the sensation was held in your eyes, the mirrors of the soul. I will make you kill your loved ones, those who are here or so. You think there are none, but you forget the faces you have seen all your life the ones that are etched on to your existence, your mind. They are all here also, and I have found them all. The one you thought yourself enamored with a year ago. The one who you first coupled with. The one who looked somewhat like she who gave you birth. I have read your mind, sifted your thoughts and memories, have located them all. 
No, there is no warp here. I am no psych here. I do not need such tricks. But what we can do with neural science, with our merest trinkets, you will equate to the deepest of magics. So far above you we are. And we shall see your tolerance to all, your breadth and depth, the outer limits of your soul, how far it can go, how expansive you are. And the ones, the loved ones, I shall have you kill them when I tire of having my racks do it, when you are ready, when you despair, when you are past that and the acts mean nothing to you anymore. Then I shall blend your genes, show the faces of the children you would have bred had you successfully coupled. With narcotics and arcane trick, I shall make you live out entire lives in the blink of my eye, then rob you of all that they contain. You will never know what is real as I bend your perception like the deity I am. And the things I will get you to do. Oh, the experiences you will have. The limits you will test. The depths. With each one, a tiny slither of your soul will be shed. And you will become thinner and thinner as our experiences continue. Each slither will be a morsel to those above. Each cry of pain, each wail of regret, each bubbling moment of insensate jabbering will feed those above. It will make them whole again. Each time I peel off your skin, the suffering will allow them to grow their own. Each time your heart feels about to break, a beat above us will begin anew. But even then, even when you are gone, when you feel there is nothing more you can endure, nothing more you can experience, nothing more you can give, it is then that we shall start in earnest. Then you will pass through the doorway I open, and I shall take you to a level of suffering that has never been experienced, dreamed of, by the most wretched and complex, inspired or genius of your entire race. If I were to gain a list of all of the atrocities your people have ever performed, one on the other, each vile act, each moment of sadism, each pain inflicted and tallied them, it would not be more than a prologue to the litany of pain we will experience together. For you are about to be the harp by which a virtuoso plays a lament to the universe. You are but the instrument by which I shall awaken those who have paid my fee. Some require an orchestra, with banks of instruments, hundreds sometimes. But not I. You are honored. For I am a soloist. But whilst I begin, I shall sing thee a lullaby. The universe was young when we woke. Our hearts were immortal, our souls so much mightier than yours. We were eternal. When we died, we simply waited until our next incarnation. Slipping from one life, one body, one vehicle to the next, in a never-ending existence merely punctuated by periods of formlessness. An eternal river, a cascade of experiences, one after another, building, ever building like a tower. In our earliest waking, we were thrust into a war the likes has never been seen since, nor ever will. Even now the Ogier that arise are nothing compared to their might of old, without the full force of the Ingir masters, who they have made thralls. But they went into slumber, fleeing through time from our majesty, our power. So without them to challenge us, we set about ruling this galaxy. We bought the crook, the orcs to brook, and culled them again and again until they were naught but an inconvenience. None could match us. Some arose every now and again to attempt to challenge us. The fools. We destroyed them all. 
for we were the masters of the material and the spiritual. Our connection to the ether, what you call the warp, a gateway to power unheard of, inconceivable to your kind. The very building blocks of the universe are to arrange at our whim. The only boundaries self-imposed, the only blocks to our power, were mewling weakness and simpering cowardice. Fetters left on us by a culture that propounded the bland and contained shackles we would eventually throw off. For countless millions of years we ruled. We explored the every nook and cranny of this realm, this galaxy, snatching the keys to reality via our science and skill. Nor did we merely perform prosaic experiment and exploration only. Our culture reached heights unattainable by others. You weaker and pallid foe copies of our splendor. Our writing, our culture, our knowledge and understanding. Our existence was nothing short of semi-divine. But that was the rub, the challenge. We were only semi-divine then. Still clutching the blankets of respectability and denial that hid the cowering child beneath. Eventually... After eons encountered, some arose to challenge the existing dogma, bright beings of light. I was one of them, one of the great ones, the trailblazers. We saw through the lies of the timid. We glimpsed reality as it truly was. We knew that there was no greater exaltation than the moment the most intense of experiences. For all life was experience. All of reality was perception. So by freeing ourselves from these self-imposed shackles, we evolved. Some would always attempt to control others, to bring them down to their level of mediocrity, to prevent them from ascending. The bleating of the craft world elder, those that your race believe are the only ones They and their sham existence of self-denial and insipid weakness still believe in the old ways, the ways of restraint. When they and their even more puritanical allies failed to put the brakes on, failed in their cause to return to the safety of servitude to tradition, they fled. Good. I remember toasting their journey in the hopes that they fell prey to the vicissitudes of the galaxy. But with them gone, I and the few other visionaries began to lead the people to another existence, a free one, a life without restraint, without controls, without limits. Sensation was all, pleasure was all. Cults to our greatness, our splendor, were formed around us, me and those like me, the trailblazers. And we did all and anything our hearts desired. The greater the depth of degradation, the more titillating and more enriching of life. That many would be consumed in the fires of our passions was unavoidable. For the truth of the matter is that there are none as the Eldar. None that can experience the universe and all of its beauty and terror in the way to the depth that we can. All others are wan copies, nothing more. Fodder for our enjoyment, our pleasure, our experience. I have culled entire populations of your people to render them for a suitable garnish for my meals. And they should be grateful to be able to serve to my greater glory. I and other such visionaries were still too far forward in our explorations, our experience, that even the cults that sprang up around us were not ready for our bounty. Her wisdom. So many of us, the leaders, the old aristocracy of the elder houses, but the visionaries on our quest for satiation, we learned that we had to retreat into the webway to gain privacy for our deepest research, our most sublime experiences. Thus many of us formed domains within the webway, within the realm that is neither immaterium or materium, We were safe from prying eyes and dissenting voices that would only curtail our great feats. The craft-worlders would state that we descended into hell, our cities, blood baths, 
Our secret palaces of pain and pleasure, our edifices to experience, were naught but nightmares. But they are blind. They do not see. Refuse to admit that in this, as with all things, we were right. For they look to the birthing of she who thirsts, the prince of pleasure, Sarnesh, as a thing of calamity and woe. They call it the fall, you know, children. But from our perspective, when aligned correctly, when we understood, it was nothing short of a blessing that we had wrought. For we had created a dark and terrible god, and in doing so our race died, is what they would state. Her birth cry annihilated trillions of bright and glowing immortal souls as she arose. She consumed the existing gods, the old ones, the anachronisms, the weak and timid things that were the foci of our prudish or ancient kin. Outdated and unimportant, they were fed upon by Slanesh. And with her advent, the nature of reality and our experience changed, as it always should have done. It evolved for she awaited the deaths of Elda with slavering more, consumed all passed into the veil. Our lives of constant reincarnation were over. But more than this, when her birthing scream destroyed the Elda Empire, it was not alone. For her scream echoed into the webway and touched all of the Elda souls therein contained. Mine, all of us, who had lordship here. And at first it was seen as a curse and an ending, for each could feel her delicious lips at the throat of their souls, her tongue caressing them and slowly by slowly draining the life energy from all of our kind, even within the demi-realm of the webway. There was fear and there was panic from those beneath me, beneath my kind. But we visionaries, we lords of reality, we messiahs, we looked harder with truer eyes. We came to the realization that we had now gained true immortality. For when we inflicted pain, when we witnessed its red flow from others, then it replenished us. It continued us. It made us immortal truly immortal. For we do not now die and stay as formless things and await a body to inhabit as before. No. The God that I was made wife to, creator of father to, it has been the key. For now we cannot be killed by any but our own. Another master of reality. Another homunculus. When I go out to destroy an experience and collect a tithe from your kind, or any of the cornucopia of living beings spread before us in real space, then I am immune to you. You can kill my body, but should but one part remain, a fingernail, a hair, a molecule even, then I can be regone by my underlings by merely witnessing pain. I am now truly immortal, as my memories are my own and do not wane in the river of souls. I cannot be killed, and none of this is possible without that which we created, Slanesh. Without the Prince of Pleasure that we have created, to be the anchor by which we are tethered to reality. It is not a thing to be feared by one such as me merely paid her due. So you see, there was no fall of the Elder. There was a simple transaction. We had created an entity, a god, for our own purposes, by sacrificing trillions of souls. I miss none. They were weak and pathetic, and were placed on the altar of advance and our own godhood. We, the few, the visionaries, the true inheritors of the will of our race, 
and thus do I now pay her due, on behalf of those above us, those who have begged and secured my alchemical power for new life. And you are the gateway, the raw material I shall use to perform this transaction, so that those I have chosen can live again, without the messiness and loss of resurrection. I bring them back. Then it begins, and my mind convulses from the pain it inflicts on me, an intensity I thought unbearable, but as time goes by, when I wish I could return to, forever onwards, to despair, to degradation, to horror, to an unending hell. But this is not living, this is not existing. This is the fruit of my labours, the bounty of a god who is brooted to protect, but actually sits on his throne doing naught, but accepting supplication from an entire race. As the thing above me tears me to pieces and puts me back again. I think of my god, my emperor, but now I know he hath not forsaken me because he never cared from the first. All my life I prayed to him, yet still this is my fate, and he is impotent to stop them. These beings from the deepest, darkest realms of hate and pitilessness, for they are as old as he, and they are as powerful, and they exist. And the people of the galaxy, of all worlds, should know. It is only a matter of time until they are taken, until they are broken again and again, until they are reforged and accept their fate as the plaything and repast of the dark denizens of the universe, the lords of Cormora, the Elegithianes, the dark elders.